All right, I, I think we are ready to begin. Um, so thank you for joining us here tonight. This is um, the second in a series of Making the Best Place Community Summits, um, Making the Best Place for All Community Summits that will be taking place over the next several months. Um, so my name is James Kitchen. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Constituent Services for County Executive Pittman. I'm gonna be moderating the discussion this evening. With me over here is Vincent Molden. He is the Assistant Director for Community Engagement and Constituent Services, and he's also the Engagement Officer for Region 8, so the part of the county that we are in now. So if you don't know Vincent already, make sure you, you hang out and talk with him at the evening before the evening's over. Um, and he's gonna help us take notes this evening. So we, we record all of your comments, all of your questions. Um, we can do appropriate follow-up, and if we don't have answers you're looking for right now, we, we can do that research and get back to you. Um, we have some other county staff um, with us here this evening. And boss, can you pass, there's a sheet right there that has, has all of them so I don't forget one. Um, but I'm gonna try to do this just by looking around. Nope, we got it. Thank you. So we do, um, from the Office of Planning and Zoning, we have Director Steve Kai Ziegler. Um, from Inspections and Permits, we have the Director Mark Wiedemeyer. From the Department of Public Works, we have Director Chris Phipps. Um, and then we have Eric Kettering and Christina Pompa also from Planning and Zoning are, are here. Um, I saw Jim Krimple walk in from Emergency Management. He, he's back here as well. Um, have I missed anybody? There we have four former county staff. Oh, we have our administrating hearing officer is here. Doug, Holman, Doug Holman's here. Um, th thanks for being here, Doug. Uh, we have for former county employee in, in Matt Johnston. Um, I'm still a little bit bitter that he left. Um, he's now the executive director of the Arundel Rivers Federation. So th thank you for being with us tonight. Um, but, but honestly, thank, thank all of you for showing up and hanging out with us as well. So tonight, the, the way this is gonna work is we are mainly gonna be discussing the issues of education, the environment and health, and then public safety. And so after an opening statement by County Executive Pittman, we're gonna spend about 20 minutes um, in a discussion about each of those topics. County Executive Pittman's then gonna make closing remarks, and then he'll stay around for about half an hour or so afterwards if people wanna mingle and, and just talk with him in, individually. You can do that as well. Um, so after the County Executive makes his opening remarks, we're gonna start the community discussion portion of the night. So we're actually gonna have a community member that's gonna introduce each one of those segments, education, the environment, health, and, and public safety. Um, and then after that introduction, we'll, we'll open the mic up. Some people pre-registered, submitted questions, other told us as you came in, you were gonna talk. We will go through those, and then if there's still time, just anyone can ask a question um, if they want to, um, and, and we will do that. Um, after we go through those three topics, if people have questions on, on a different topic and if time allows then we will handle those questions as well um, we will have allow you to have a minute to, to make your statement um, or to ask a question again it, it doesn't have to be a question you can just tell us an idea um, tell us how to how to do our jobs better it can be any kind of statement you want to make to the county executive Pittman and, and the government team that you have in the room um, but you can also ask a question if that is what you want to do I do ask you try to keep your comment to that one minute time period just so we can keep the, the, the conversation moving through. Um, and I ask that you keep it to the topic of the evening that we're on. We wanna do like all the education ones first and, and then we'll move again to environment and health and, and then public safety and then have um, at, at the end again, it's just some open comment time. So without any further ado, I'm gonna bring up County Executive Pittman. All right. Thanks James. and. Uh, Thank you to all my staff who has to keep showing up at town halls all the time. It's, um, it's one of the downsides of working for me. Um, so what we're gonna do tonight is uh, talk about where we stand on some issues and really what I want all of you to do is think about, think about the future and what we should be doing, um, how we can use the tools of government to, to make our communities better. And, and um, it's, uh, our crowd is a little bit smaller tonight than it was last week. We had region, we're in Region um, uh, 8 now, we're in Region 9, which is sort of parallel uh, to the east of us, and I think a lot of people just think South County, and so there are a lot of people who are in this region who are at that meeting um, over at the Galesville Community Center, and, um, but that's okay. We'll have, uh, everybody will have their opportunity to have a say tonight, um, which wasn't the case the other night. Um, so to, to me, I guess, as I look back over the last um, three and a half years that I've been in this job, I, I, um, 
I have noticed that the most important things that we've accomplished and the most difficult things we've accomplished are because people organized, people got together. So when we did the forest conservation bill, there were, you know, people packed the council chambers and, and that's true of a lot of the different things that we did. And, um, and some of the hard things have been the big things on land use planning. And I think anybody who knows anything about me knows um, I come from around here. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, uh, grew up on a family farm and uh, was actually making my living on the farm before I was, I was in this job, um, training horses, making hay, and, and also running a nonprofit that had to do with, uh, with horses. Um, so I, while I've always been engaged in the community and had a background um, doing some government things um, and things on housing, uh, I really do um, think of myself more as a South County person than as a county executive, so I feel pretty comfortable here. I think the last time I was here in this room, it was about um, solar on farms, and the place was packed. Uh, some of you may remember that. It was before I was the county executive. Um, so they worked on that legislation before. I didn't have to do that one, thank goodness. Um, so I do want to say, though, that, that for this part of the county, um, I sometimes have to explain to elected officials in other parts of the county, and sometimes residents, but particularly people on the county council, I found, um, why it is that it's okay to keep South County rural. Why it is that it makes sense to have some parts of the county open space and other parts of the county higher density development. Um, we always talk about smart growth and transit oriented development makes sense because it gets cars off the road and people kind of get that. And some people want to live close to where they work and, and uh, not have to drive and maybe even close to a train station and you got to do development to accommodate that. Um, but almost every county has figured out, and certainly planners have figured out, and I try to explain over and over again, that it makes sense financially for the county to have some open space, some agricultural areas, some areas where there's not development. And that's because you don't have to spend all that money on the infrastructure. So I have heard people say to me, well, come on, why not the Route 2 corridor? Just put sewer and water down there and develop along the corridor. You can still have your farms back behind all of that. Um, but it's expensive to put sewer and water down and to provide all those services. And so people have chosen to live in a more rural part of the county, and that's good for county government because there are fewer services. And, and so it works out that way. Um, smart growth is actually the fiscally most responsible way to do, to do planning for the county. Um, the, uh, the overall, I mean, before we get into some of the specific issues and talk about them, I just want to say something about the overall condition of county government, the tool that we're talking about using, um, and it's good fiscally. It's actually better than it's ever been in history. So uh, the first year when I came in, I think people knew that, that our county um, was losing teachers, it was losing police officers, and it was losing firefighters to other jurisdictions because pay was lower here. We've always had lower property taxes and lower income taxes in our county than the region, and I want to keep it that way, and that's, that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. It does make people want to do business here, and it makes people want to live here, too. Um, but we have to do, in my view, we have to support the basic institutions of lo local government, and that, in this case, meant we had to do for our police officers, our firefighters, and our teachers, we had to get their pay up to the regional average and that costs some money. And we had to hire more too. We actually are at now close to 800 sworn officers and we were under 700 when I came in. And it was because the, the National Association of Police Chiefs said, we are way understaffed. We grew, we developed, but we forgot about, about some of those services. So same thing happened with fire. And we've, we've hired 531 new teachers. We've created 531 new teaching positions over the last four years. And particularly um, for our special ed programs and our mental health counselors in our schools because those were areas that were that were underserved um, but we managed to do all that um, and at the same time improve our bond rating so Anne Arundel County had never gotten a AAA bond rating from Moody's and they come in from New York and they look at they look at the the the, the fiscal condition of your county and what we were able to do was actually in this last budget reduce the amount that we borrow because we had surpluses because we budgeted conservatively, just like a business person. You can budget conservatively and you have money left over at the end of the year, then you put it into something like the rainy day fund that the county has and you, you borrow less, you have better fiscal condition and you set yourself up for future economic downturns. And I hate to, to, to say it, but we may be heading for a future 
economic, we've already seen an, an economic downturn. Um, so that's all good news. The last budget that we passed uh, this year was the first bipartisan budget. It was a six to one budget. And, um, and so I feel good about all that. But I do, I do want to just put a warning as we think about how we're going to spend and what we're going to spend it on in the coming years that we may not have the kind of money that we've had the last few years. These surpluses have been great. And we, the federal assistance has been great, too. Uh, but I don't expect that to continue. Um, so we're going to have to be careful about what we spend. Um, so I will stop there. And uh, I think we're going to be talking particularly about public safety and about education and about health and the environment. So we can get into a lot of the details of, of the things that, that we do or can do or maybe should or shouldn't do um, in terms of, of um, development regulations and um, protection of the farmland that we have. I do want to talk some about agriculture because we're in the part of the county where most of the farms are. Um, and and uh, I think there are some opportunities there. We have a new ag commission that is made up of exclusively of farmers that really is focusing on making agriculture commercially viable because that's how you maintain the open space, by making it commercially viable. Um, so, and it's how we feed each other too. Um, so we don't know what the future is gonna bring, but I can tell you during the pandemic, I was, I was wishing that we had better infrastructure to support our farms to get more of the land into production of food locally and um, and we have to set ourselves up for that in the future as well i know we have farm bureau here some folks um, and, and some other farmers in the room so we can talk about all of that stuff i will sit down and shut up for a minute and uh hear what some of you have to say but i'll be back all right thank you county executive so i'd now like to call up miss nelson brown to introduce the education segment Good evening, everyone. My name is Nelsa Brown. Many of you know me. I'm a member of the Ralph Bunch Community Center, right up the road, right up the highway. I serve in the capacity of grant chairperson and historian of our center. I also attend Adams United Methodist Church right up the road. Our community center, located in Edgewater, was originally called the Mill Swamp School. Because of the location of a mill in the area used to process the grain harvested by the early settlers, Native Americans, and the slaves transported from their native lands. It was later renamed the Ralph J. Bunch Community Center in honor of the late Dr. Ralph J. Bunch, the first African American to be awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. His for the 1940s mediation in Israel and playing a major role in the formation of the United Nations. The first Mill Swamp School consisted of just two rooms, an outhouse, that's an outside toilet for those of you too young to know. <laughs> and an outside pump where the older boys and girls pump their own water for drinking and washing hands. School was seasonal because of the farming season. It ran from October through April, but yet they still learn. They learned enough to read and write and help their parents. Later, Four more classrooms were added, and they still learn even more. Now they could handle their own family's businesses, and now they could do more than be laborers and maids and farmers. Not that farming was a bad thing. That was the major industry during that time here. They learned so much, but with so very little. It is because of them, our ancestors, that we, the Mill Swampians, we called ourselves, 
and the alumnus of the former Mill Swamp School endeavor to stress the importance of education in our communities because a good education is life changing. After I retired as an editor writer from the federal government, I worked for five years in the Anne Arundel County school system. What an eye opener. First as a long term sub teaching language arts at Old Mill Middle South. Then as a co-teacher for science and history at Annapolis Middle School and finishing my last year's assignment as a corrective reading teacher at Annapolis Middle School. But before leaving the school system, I subbed throughout the county and got a taste of what really goes on in the county schools. I do know that the county does not control the policy level decisions of Anne Arundel Public Schools, but I do appreciate the partnering, the partnering and the provision of the necessary funds the county gives us to support our county schools. The annual step and cost of living increases are surely appreciated by all of our educators. I know because I've experienced how hard, how very hard our teachers work to educate our young people and to connect with them. Adding 531 new teaching positions, which helps to decrease class sizes, 71 new social emotional learning positions, which is very big when you think about what's going on in the world and in our society today, and 249 special education positions. An increased community college funding has led to top national honors. I am so proud to say this evening that my niece, an honor roll student and a recent graduate of Annapolis High School's class of 2022 will be, ten will be attending AACC this fall. Yes, we've come far from two room schoolhouses to a nationally honored college. But what is the vision for the future, I ask you, County Executive? We've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. So I ask you, where do we go from here? How can you improve our system so that educating and protecting our young people will be given the highest priority in these uncertain times of ours? And on a personal note, I have a seven-year-old great-granddaughter, and she's afraid to go back to school in September because of all the violence and the things she hears from her peers and out in society. So I ask you, what can be done, not only to improve her education in the future, but also what can be done to keep her safer? Thank you. Thank you, Nelsa, for the history lesson as well as the questions. <laughs> um, anybody who doesn't know where Ralph Bunch is, it's on Mill Swamp Road that connects Muddy Creek and Route 2. And um, the building is not in great shape, and we're doing something about that. Uh, we've done some work, gotten some state money as well as some county money to, to make some repairs to the roof and other parts of it. But, there's a bigger initiative underway and working on figuring out exactly what services will be there. But I've got to tell you that I was inspired when I, I went to a, um, an annual breakfast that alumni of, of Ralph Bunch put together and um, met a lot of folks who had actually gone to school there. I already knew some people who had gone to school there and was just inspired by the way they wanted to preserve history. And I've got to say, there's a lot of, a lot of history in South County. And, um, when our, when our young people know history, I think they, um, they feel more grounded, they feel like they've got a sense of place, and, and they, um, um, I think it gives them some hope. So uh, teaching history, I'm a big advocate of throughout the public school system, 
And, um, but that's only a part of it all. I, I gotta tell you that for the school system, the question was, what's my vision? How are we gonna get through, especially in these times where students are having these challenges? A lot of these challenges are mental health challenges. Um, and I, I would say a lot of these mental health challenges result from being attached to devices all the time. But like you said, I don't get to tell the school system what the curriculum should look like. I don't tell them uh, how to teach. I write a check, it's basically my job. <laughs> and they don't necessarily listen to me. I, do have a, I did have a monthly meeting with Dr. Arlotta, the superintendent, and I would talk to some school board members around budget time when they're advocating for, for money, uh, but, but um, limited, limited impact. Um, but there are some things that really worry me about um, the, the future of our schools. And the biggest one is the same thing that worries most business people in the county, which is hire, finding and hiring and keeping good people. So the schools are only as good as the teachers and the staff that work in them. And uh, we've created a lot of positions right now that are not filled in our schools. And uh, particularly for special ed this year, they're having a lot of trouble hiring uh, people in that field, it doesn't pay great, and, and it's really, really difficult work working with those kids. And, and so um, there's a labor shortage. There's a labor shortage in business too. And it is, it is improving somewhat right now, but it's an uncertain time um, with all that. And that labor shortage also impacts all county government. And, and um, I'm not saying we automatically just double everybody's pay because we can't afford to do that either. But we do have to make the jobs desirable and make sure that people feel like they're serving when they're, whether it's in government or in the school system and really recognize that those, um, those teachers, those educators are, are heroes and treat them that way. Um, so um, the, the big change, I guess, in schools is, is that there is this new thing called, coming from the state, called the Blueprint for Education. Some people call it the Kerwin Commission. And it's pretty specific about areas where each county has to invest and, and, and grow. Um, some of it, I think, is fantastic. When kids get to kindergarten, their being assessed is not ready, and that's, that's a problem. And so universal pre-K will be available in a few years. It's a business opportunity as well for people to set up um, better daycare and in some cases do pre-kindergarten as, as part of that and have, it, um, have some financial help from the, from the state in doing so. Um, you know, we have an opportunity gap, achievement gap, whatever you want to call it. We have a joint commission with the school system on that so that every kid has um, whatever help they need to get them in those early years especially, learning to read, get going, and have a positive experience in the schools. Um, and there's work with that. There's a community schools initiative where schools have, have um, folks who work with the community. And what we've done in county government to have more say in the schools is we've gone to them and said, let's work together, we serve the same families. And so we have not only joint, the joint initiative on the opportunity gap, but a joint mental health task force so that for the first time ever, the county mental health agency is working with the school mental health people. It used to be that the crisis response teams couldn't get into the school during a crisis because the principal had to give permission and there just wasn't a good system of communication and services. So, um, we got to do the, the mental health work. Uh, some of that is research in every county and all over the country is struggling with the same thing. Um, but, um, but we got to provide the, provide the financial support um, for the people who work in our schools so that they will continue in the job and not leave the job. That's, that's our biggest fear. Um, so, um, you know, and beyond that, I got to say in, in, in the schools in this area, uh, there is more capacity than in some other areas. There are new schools being built. There's a whole new cluster, the um, old mill um, up in the northern part of the county, additional schools being built to, to deal with overcrowding. Um, there will be some redistricting as a result of that to accommodate the new schools, um, but um, um, we've managed to keep up. We're one of the only counties that has really managed to keep up with the school construction plan that we have in place. Um, so we've just got to staff our schools with great teachers and make sure that they, they're appreciated and support them. So support them whenever you can. Um, so I'll stop there on education. Are we doing questions on education yes. now or, yeah. or thoughts on education? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So now what we'll do is I'll call those of you who you know, indicated that you have a question or comment on education up to the microphone here in the middle. Um, again, you're going to have one minute to, to make a comment, ask your question. Um, keep the education, and, and please remember to get your, your mouth sort of close to the mic so that everyone around can, can hear you when you're making it. 
Um, so first up is Melissa Stanton. Okay. Okay. Um, Jaquela Call. Question on education. Very good. Also, does anybody have a question on education <laughs> or a or state a statement? statement so <laughs> anything on our, our school system? All right. So I had I had one submitted ahead of time that that, that I'll read, um, and it basically asked if there is any effort or, or movement. Um, to, to find somebody in, in the Lothian area, some place for kids to do after school, to like an enriched education, almost like a community center type area in, in this part of the county. Is there any talk or any movement on that? Did you write that question? I did not. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I promise you it's right here. Okay, because as you said that, I thought, oh my God, I think I was supposed to read these pre-submitted questions, so I would be prepared for them, and I, I did not read them, sorry. Um, but I can handle that one, because it's a great question, because there's a good answer. Uh, um, and the answer is that, um, yeah, there's clearly a need for more uh, indoor recreation space in South County, more recreation space and fields in South County, and, and, um, um, and more for youth to do. And so um, right on the farm between here and the elementary school um, is some land that uh, the Cheney family uh, has, has purchased and is working with the Boys and Girls Club and is about to start the fundraising. Uh, some of that money will be coming from them to do a new Boys and Girls Club. And so we went to them and we said, well, can we maybe work with you and use the, attach to it or put adjacent to it? There's plenty of land there. Um, some additional services. And so that conversation is underway. What we did um, is in the northern part of the county in Severn is a Severn Center. We call it the Severn Intergenerational Center because it's a senior center attached to a boys and girls club with a basketball court in the middle and some community space. And that's under construction right now. And it, we think it's a pretty good model. Um, so there's a possibility of a library. Uh, sound just changed. Um, um, and some other things there. So we're in those conversations. It's a site, um, and there's a need. So stay tuned. All right. So, so last call for any any comment or question on the topic of education. Yes. Can you even see me over this thing? <laughs> but okay, I usually need a little uh, booster. Okay, uh, hello, is this too loud? No. Um, my name is Melissa Stanton. Uh, as you can see, I am wearing a green shirt. There are three people in the front row here also with, with the same shirt. Um, I am a, a board member of the Davidsonville Area Civic Association. Uh, nickname, we call it DACA. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about DACA um, in a second. So um, I moved here about 20 years ago. I'm a native New Yorker. I'm uh, from Long Island, went to school and worked in the city. Uh, I will say one thing about taxes here. Nobody likes property taxes, but um, I have always been pleasantly surprised that um, compared to other places I have lived and the services that we get here compared to other places, um, our taxes are fairly low. For compared to New York, <laughs> compared to New York, but also for the D.C. area. Um, when I left um, the New York area, I was paying thirteen thousand dollars a year in property taxes on a small house on one fifth of an acre, um, and we had to pay extra uh, to have our trash picked up. So uh, very different. Um, so as I said, I moved here twenty years ago. First to um, a very complex HOA neighborhood in Edgewater that I won't name, and uh, Glenn left that and moved to Davidsonville, 
where I have lived since uh, 2005 in a non-HOA neighborhood. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a board member of DACA. If you live in the Davidsonville, Harwood area and aren't yet a member of DACA, I would really encourage you to join. Um, it costs just $20 a year. Uh, DACA was founded about 50 years ago by local residents and farmers who were concerned about um, potential overdevelopment in this area. And I truly think that if DACA did not exist, um, much of South County would be a lot like the congested areas above uh, 214. Um, and so we are very lucky um, to have the rural community uh, that we do down here. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the environmental issues that are kind of specific to our area. And I'll just note a few. Um, as we all know, uh, we do not have municipal water. We are on wells. Um, as such, uh, the safety and availability of the aquifers that supply our wells is really essential and important. Um, because we value and want to keep South County rural, it's essential that we fairly and effectively balance the needs of farmers and landowners with the cleanliness, safety, and viability of our air, soil, water, and waterways. Um, because we want to keep South County rural, uh, we need to be smart about how our area is developed so we aren't spreading sprawl by overbuilding homes. And I will note that one way, not to, uh, to, to, one way to meet housing needs without overbuilding or adding more infrastructure, um, a, a, something called an accessory dwelling unit, which the county does allow um, and can allow more of. Um, but right now, the county does allow um, attached ADUs, and, and those are very beneficial for uh, homeowners and, and people of all ages. Um, we need to be smart ab about not being overly restrictive of the commercial services and businesses we need in this area, because uh, nobody wants to have to drive 10 miles to get to everything. Um, and we need to be smart about not making our roadways so wide and fast and that um, they're unsafe for walking, bicycling, or even just driving. Um, so I know that your administration is very concerned about environmental issues. Um, I know that when um, one of the things that I was impressed by uh, when you were running years ago uh, was taking seriously the issues that are affecting our county and the world about uh, there are more natural disasters happening. There's more extreme weather happening. Um, you know, downtown Annapolis is flooding more than it used to. Um, those are all issues that need to be addressed. Um, I can tell you that in my day job, I am about to publish um, a, a disaster resilience toolkit, it's called, for how local leaders such as yourself uh, can better predict and mitigate the risks of climate change and natural disasters to older residents. Um, because uh, a lot of local leaders just think that as long as they've addressed the issues of people in nursing homes, the older population is, is good to go. Um, but, you know, we have people of all ages living independently all over the county, um, and their needs uh, do need to be recognized, um, especially, you know, when there is a, a natural disaster or, you know, tornado. We almost had one here just a few days ago. Um, so uh, that's all I have to say. Um, do you have, uh, one thing we did want to talk about is, you know, this sheet has a list of uh, achievements thus far from your administration about environmental issues. What things um, do you still have on your plate and want to see done? And um, the audience can share what they're interested in. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa, and thanks all of you for keeping DACA strong. I, I've always called it DACA, not DACA. I don't know if there's a, per, a correct way to say it. Okay. All right. <laughs> Well, my dad was one of the, the founding members, and, and um, um, he's no longer with us, but he would, um, 
let me know somehow if I let too much development happen in South County, I would be in trouble. Um, my mother would, would um, make me pay. She's still with us to do that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot left to do on, on environmental issues, on development issues, and, and um, I like a lot of the things that you said. Um, you know, we do have to have some commercial, uh, we, we need to have support our small businesses in South County, I guess you could say, and, and um, that doesn't mean creating shopping malls, um, but we love our smaller businesses that we can get to, and, and um, um, you know, they have had a rough go of it, and so um, please support them. Uh, the, probably the biggest, there are a couple big challenges. One, one um, in, the, in the coming years, we have to implement what we said we were going to do in our general development plan, that plan 2040. And one of the things that we did was to go back to um, what used to be small area planning. There were 16 small area plans in the early 2000s. And um, those were great plans, but they were sort of stuck on a shelf and not used. So what we did for plan 2040 is we said there will be no comprehensive rezoning in this county where the county, the politicians, the county council all gets to, you know, um, uh, play whatever kind of a chess game they play and you end up rezoning land um, um, in a political manner. Each area will do their region plan, each of the nine areas, and this is a region. That's why we're doing these by region, even though we're not doing the planning process yet. Um, and work with the Office of Plan and Zoning and, and envision what they want the future of their area to look like and, and, um, and then the County Council can consider any kind of a rezoning to complement that, to implement that plan. Um, but one of the big things in both the, the countywide general development plan and I, I suspect it will be in the region plans is green infrastructure. And um, Matt, Matt Johnston was our environmental policy director and one of his final one of the things he had to do before he left was make sure that that green infrastructure master plan got approved. And that's a plan to, to get to 30% of the county's land mass preserved and stay, to stay green by the year 2030. And, and uh, we're not starting from zero, fortunately, but we do have to accelerate the work that we're doing. And so we have to convince more people, um, more farmers to put their, their, their farms in ag preservation, but we have to make it appealing. Um, and other landowners to put their land in, in preservation programs and work with a lot of the, the land trusts and nonprofit um, organizations that help protect land to do that. Um, so some of that happens as a result of some of our regulations, like forest conservation actually made some land probably undevelopable. Um, some of the environmental restrictions we have um, are at least too expensive to develop uh, into houses. Um, and some of, the, some of the restrictions we have where we're actually enforcing laws that have been on the books for a long time that we weren't enforcing, um, on, on wetlands and steep slopes and specimen trees. Some of that, some of that work um, is now in green notices. So the developers, when they come in, will have a better sense of, of how the law is going to be looked at and perceived. But I think the, one of the most impactful things we did is we said that there will not be modifications to the law. Modifications are how a lot of development happens. A lot of, you sort of have to in Anne Arundel County do modifications to get anything done because our laws are sometimes so restrictive, you know, law on top of law and regulation on top of regulation that you can't get anything done without modifications. But if the modification is gonna hurt the environment, it's not gonna be granted unless you can compensate for that loss to the environment with, with some other kind of mitigation. Um, and that was a real game changer. So you've seen some development projects not happen that would otherwise have happened. Um, had there not been a grandfathering clause in the forest conservation bill, there would be other tracks that would be protected from, from development. But um, for the, you know, keeping South County rural and protecting the areas around our streams as well um, for all of our, our um, environmental impacts, um, it's, it's the work of some of these guys <laughs> that, is, that is, actually, is actually doing it. And, and they have to be fair. I'm talking about plan and zoning and, and, um, um, and inspections and permits. And they have, to be, they have to be fair. And we have to be able to do the good development that we say we want done. And it's really hard when you, they don't control the, the law. They have to implement the law. They don't get to go to the count. I mean, they try to go to the council and get changes in the law. We try to go, but you don't always get it done because it's seven votes and you have to get four. And, and so um, the, the code needs to be rewritten. Everybody agrees with that. And that's, that's something that we will try to do. But um, um, 
implementing what we have has protected a lot of a lot of the open space. So we have to implement our green infrastructure master plan. I think we have to do better with our vegetative master plan, our vegetative plan as well, something that Rec and Parks is going to be taking on with our invasives that kind of destroys some of the ecosystems that we have. Um, we're doing the Resilience Authority, which is also going to complement some of the work we're doing to protect the watershed, um, and that's something that th this county is led on, and, and, um, and that, wor that work is just getting started. Um, you know, we've done the, the, the um, no discharge zones in all of the waterways, or the first county, I think, um, certainly in the state, that has done a countywide no discharge zone so that the boats can't flush their toilets into the water and they have to do pump out stations. Um, and, and um, you know, we did styrofoam, but now we're looking at plastic bags and whether there's a way to regulate that so they don't end up all over the place. Um, so still a lot of work to do. Um, and, and then there's the whole issue of renewable energy. Uh, which is an environmental issue as well. And you've seen that we've got, um, we've got a plan so that all of the county's energy will be either um, produced on site in renewable form or purchased as renewable form by 2030. Um, another in initiative that um, Chris Phipps in Public Works has worked with, with Matt and others to, to do, and we've got landfills that are gonna have solar panels on them very soon, um, and hopefully buildings with solar panels on them very soon, and a lot of electric vehicles um, I don't know if you saw my Back to the Future video, but it was really cool. Um, we got our first electric vehicles <laughs> in Ronald County. So that's a start. Questions on uh, or comments on environmental and, yeah. and development? So we have a couple of people that signed up. First up is um, Billy Ford. Had, so you want to make a comment on environmental? Yeah, absolutely. We'll pass. So, all right. Matt Johnson signed up to make a comment on environmental issues. Uh -oh. I won't pass. Okay. <laughs> No, first off, great to see everybody here. Um, so Matt Johnson, uh, Executive Director of the Arundel Rivers Federation. So if you don't know, a few years back, um, South River Federation and the West of Arundel River Keeper joined, merged to become the Arundel Rivers Federation. Um, we do a lot of work across the whole county, but specifically in those watersheds, Southwest and Road Rivers. And so I guess that my question, County Executive, um, is I know that there's a new push, um, and this is for Chris Phipps as well, there's a new push for about 8,000 um, linear feet of stream restoration, restoring all the streams that are just degraded in South Southern and Arundel County. And that's a lot of the work that Arundel Rivers Federation can do, and do that hard work to reach out to you all in the community, find landowners who would be willing to restore their streams. So the question is, that's hard work, and we're rural here in South County and need all the help we can get. So how can the county step up and help organizations like Arundel Rivers get the capacity to do that work? This guy has no shame. <laughs> <laughs> he left, what, a month or two ago, and now in his new job he's coming back and asking for money. Um, <laughs> capacity, I say. Capacity, yeah, we know what capacity means. It's money, right? Yeah. No, I get it. Uh, <laughs> Um, so funding for the watershed um, and the stream restorations um, is done through um, the, the fees that everybody pays that, you know, um, were controversial a few years back, but at this point I think people have seen the effect of some of the, some of the, the, the great work of our, it's within public, public works, our watershed protection and restoration programs. And uh, there is a lot of work left to do, and so uh, I believe that there will be um, additional revenue that can be invested in that that will be sort of resilience authority because this is resilience too. So having a resilience authority that's out there in line for federal money um, is going to help. Uh, the, um, we can't, um, we, we do have to rely on organizations like the Arundel Rivers Federation to tell um, public works um, where the priorities are to work with public works on implementing a lot of these a lot of these restoration projects and and that started to happen so Arundel's Federa Arundel Rivers Federation um, like Severn Rivers and and um, others hopefully one day they'll all merge and become a powerhouse but um, they they should be doing this work and they will um, they will be getting funding for that to the extent that there's dollars available and as you say you need the capacity you need um, not just to be able to do the project, but to have, have staff on experts who can really um, work with the government. And, you know, one of the things that I've said from the beginning, and I've, I believe in, in a legacy I'd like to leave behind, is to strengthen the nonprofit sector. Um, nonprofit organizations can usually get things done 
close your ears, government people, but more efficiently than the government <laughs> and, and closer to the community. So um, where we can, we are, we are doing grant programs to in, improve the capacity for health and human services, but also for environmental work. So yes. So are, are there anyone else that has comments, questions, anything on environment and or health? All right, we'll bring you both. You can line up. So um, as a young lady had mentioned, we all own well water. And with well water also comes your septic system in the, in the county. And my parents joined a program to uh, a new septic system that preserves the rivers and everything. But it was, uh, the planning for the budget of that thing was pretty good. The implementation of putting that in, um, in their home was good. But now we need to meet the challenge of trying to maintain and operate that thing without the help of the county. It seems, from my observation, is that once that septic system went in, all hands are off. So we have no idea of who to find a contractor or a vendor that will maintain that thing. And, and um, if then the alarm goes off that is a, attached to that system, and the person just says, well, just hit the button. There's a reason for that alarm. <laughs> I should not be just hitting the button. I would think somebody, whoever the county installed, that with or partnered with will address that alarm and see what's going on with that system to make sure that um, that it's being operated properly. So that's the one I'm asking is um, planning around operation and maintenance of those septic, those new septic systems. If you can communicate what are the steps now that we have to take. It, I don't think it should be the responsibility of the resident to find out how to maintain that thing. I'm lucky, I have an expert in the room. Chris Phipps, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand that over to Chris Phipps, who's a director of public works, um, also a longtime South County resident. Um, any thoughts, Chris? Unfortunately, you give me a lot more credit than I do. Do you want a microphone here? I'm sorry for the you know the, the issues that you're experiencing. Um, public Works, we do conversions of septic system to public sewer when the community petitions for that. The nitrogen reducing unit that you have, which is where you take the existing septic system and put on a, it's got a blower and some improvements that help to reduce nitrogen, but you still you're still on a septic system. That's administered by the health department. So. Um, we can reach out, get your inf contact info, and get a hold of the health department. They, they should be able to give you um, a list of vendors, uh, contractors that can um, provide that maintenance. And it was my understanding that when those conversions are made, that there's a required one or two year um, operations and maintenance agreement that has to be made. Like MDE, Maryland Department of Environment, requires that, I thought. So um, maybe yours is up. The, the term, okay. So uh, we can we can follow up and get you uh, contractors' names for that. At least you got an alarm. Mine, you just have to remember to call to get somebody to pump the thing out. If you forget, it fills up. <laughs> yes, so I'll just say, make, make sure you get a business card in front of myself or Vincent before you leave, and then we can follow up. Hello, everyone. My name is Jaquela Hall. I apologize in advance because I did miss your last meeting in Galesville, um, but this pretty much covers the whole area down in South County. So I recently moved from Lothian to Shadyside, and I had to call Public Works in order to get the drainage or ditches repaired in front of my neighborhood, but unfortunately they only did my house. So that helps because my lot next door I have two was flooded completely, um, almost to the height of a stump that I have. So I called and they came and fixed mine, but the neighbor right across from me has no ditch or drainage at all. So the water is still backed up on my property because it has nowhere to go. When I call, I don't get a response for almost a week. 
Um, when they came out, they were complaining that the group was complaining because they're so small, it's only a few of them, and they cover basically Edgewater to Friendship to Lothian. That's a big area for a small team. So I would encourage Public Works to pretty much get another team for South County. We might be smaller than everyone else, but because we have so much land, it's equivalent. You know, we have to make sure that the whole neighborhood is taken care of in order for the drainage to work. I asked if the water is supposed to go towards the bay or away from the bay. Not one person could give me the answer. So there's that on that. Um, as for environmental and Lothian, um, I've worked closely with the county executive in regards to the Sands Road Park. Not sure if any of you are familiar with that, but I would highly suggest you all take a look at that online. Um, it's over 181 acres. Unfortunately, it used to be a rubber landfill. Um, and I came to find out after working with the county to get the park renovated, because it's only a basketball court, that it's actually a national, um, on the national list for asbestos. So that breaks my heart because everyone on Sands Road is on well water. So how can we have safe and healthy well water if there are some asbestos landfill on Sands Road? To me, that does not seem adequate and it does not seem fair. And I care about my neighbors, whether I live in Slothian or Shadyside, my family is still there. So I encourage you all to look at that because I want a park for Lothian. We have six mobile homes in the zip code of Lothian. And there's not one park, there's not one library and access to Lothian residents. We barely have public transportation. Can we at least do something for the Lothian residents? I don't know what you need from me, but I'm here and I'm asking you to please help me do something for these residents. Because I'm still there, that's where my heart is at. And I just need help, okay? I've been, I feel like I've been neglected. It's been two and a half years. I call Vincent almost every week and I tell him all the time, I said, this is your best friend calling again. <laughs> so I do appreciate you guys' help. You did help, but I just want to get over this hump. Um, it's to the point where I came out of my own pocket to host a community day for neighbors that I've never met. I just graduated college two years ago. I don't have it like that financially, but that's how important it was to me to make sure that my neighbors knew what park we got in Lothian. And it's been since 2004 that it's just been a basketball court. No seating, no shade, no playground. It's just a basketball court on 180 acres. Mm. To me, that's just plain right wrong. Mm. Yeah. So I just really hope you can look into that and make sure that we're taken care of in that area because with it being an asbestos landfill, it's just not a safe location for a park anymore. I really encourage it to be gated. Um, I know I read in the MDE report that it's supposed to be gated because it was an old landfill. But every day I drive by and it's not gated. I got several pictures on my phone. I make sure that I have proof to back it up. So please just, just reach out to me. You guys have my contact information. Thank you. Yeah, we need more Jacalos in the county. Um, not only because she makes us work harder, but because <laughs> she gets things done. And we are, um, um, there was a plan to put in the, the playground <laughs> next to it and then um, because of because of what was there, reversed that, um, took the playground equipment elsewhere, and now looking elsewhere for a park. And I do I do believe that there's a great opportunity with this land that um, where the Boys and Go Girls Club will be, that we can do the additional additional things there and have more recreation space. Um, unfortunately, I um, have learned that things everything takes forever in the government. Um, everything takes a long time, and there are a lot of regulations. So. Um, um, it will take some time, but um, you've got my commitment that we're going to continue to push, especially for this site, if we can make this happen here. Um, oh, and the first part of it, though, about the, the drainage ditches, um, yeah, I think the water is supposed to go downhill um, eventually, you know, eventually to the bay or to, to a, a catchment pond. But um, those drainage, the drainage dishes all throughout South County obviously are, it takes a lot of maintenance. And um, if there's anything that you would like to add about how, how the, that process works, that might be useful because I think probably a lot of people are on them. Um, but I would also just add that, that when, you're, when you're making a request for the county to do something, um, um, there's a 311 system. There's C click fix. You can actually take a picture on your phone and you can text it right to the system. And it all does go to a central place and then it gets sent out to whatever department it is that, that, um, that is supposed to take care of it. 
and it gets monitored and I actually get reports by department on you know how many complaints have come in and how many they've resolved so there's an incentive for them to actually resolve these complaints um, and within each department of course there's an incentive to resolve them so it doesn't just go into um, it, sometimes it takes longer than you want, but, but it is being pretty closely monitored. Um, requests just like that. But any, got anything to add, Chris, on, on the system for these, for these drainage dishes? And, and just the way it's supposed to work, if you don't get the response, you, you call Vincent like you do. You call the C community engagement and constituent service staff. Um, they're divided into parts of the county. And they take the tough issues and they bring it to us at our weekly meeting. And we go through the, we have a conversation about it and figure out what it can take to resolve it. Sometimes there's not a, there's not a simple answer. And, uh, and that's where we try to step in and address it. Is it yeah, just about the whole system for how, how, how these ditches are handled. Yeah, it, it's, there, it's, it's simple, but it's complex, Jacob. And, and I would like, I'd love to have you uh, participate with me next time I have a budget meeting with the county executive. Because in, in South County, especially, Mayo, Shadyside, um, Deal, we have very flat topography. And so it, I mean, it's almost 0% slope. And so it doesn't take much in a change in an elevation, deposition that, you know, you get deposits that build up, and all of a sudden it is flowing backwards. And um, you're just, you're, I can't dispute what you're saying because it does take a lot of maintenance to keep those, uh, those swales open. And the, the, the driveway culverts often get crushed. People drive over them, whatever reason, and then that can, that changes the topography, the drainage um, configuration. So they are a constant challenge, and I, I will get your contact info from, from Vincent, and I'll make sure that we follow up. And uh, Because what we also find in maintaining ditches is, you're right, you can't do it in an isolated location, because you're just, you may address that, but now you push the problems up either downstream, or maybe even upstream, because you have to maintain, they have to survey the bottom of those ditches so that they know they get positive slope from the upstream to downstream when there's very little variation in the percentage of the slope available just because of the land is so flat. Uh, there's one I've just recently been involved with where the elevation of the ditch, the bottom of the ditch is 1.4, which is 1.4 feet above sea level. So you get a, we get a tide that's more than a foot and a half and it fills the ditches, and they stay filled for, until the tide goes back out. So um, this is just, and that's in May, though. So these are just constant challenges we have. And someone can't do anything about it. We have to wait for Mother Nature to do a thing and the tide to go out. But in your, I'll have to look at your case if it's tidal effect or if it's non-tidal. Um, but I'll follow up. Hey, I just want to note that um, your state senator for this district. Sarah Elfrith just walked in. Thank you for joining us. Um, we, also, we also have the, um, the head of our South County Chamber of Commerce, Julia Howes, here. Over here. So. And we, um, I guess it's okay to announce that people who are running for office that are here because, you know, they, that you might want to talk to them. Um, we have Courtney Beniscus, who's running for delegate for this district. 
And we have Sean Livingston. Did I see Sean? Yes, there he is. He's running for uh, county council. Any other candidates for anything here? Nope. Okay. <laughs> I, I will also point out that Jessica Cook is here from Senator Cardin's office. Oh, yes. Jessica Cook. All right, we've got every level of government in the house. We can solve any problem, right? Or mess it up, as the case may be. All right, no, so now I think we're gonna transition into the public safety portion of the evening. So if John Faber can come up and intro public safety for us. So hello everybody, uh, good evening. And um, just want to introduce myself. My name is John Faber. I'm a lifelong resident of Anne Arundel County. I uh, was born to Fort Meade, grew up in Odenton, uh, met my wife who, who lived in South County, married, and, and we both moved to, uh, or now live in South County. I am currently president of the Anne Arundel County Farm Bureau, and I'm also the president of the Anne Arundel County Fair. So I look forward to everybody uh, being at the fair this uh, September. And one of uh, Anne Arundel County Farm Bureau's main goals is to pr promote and protect farming and agriculture in the county. Um, I just wanted to speak a little bit on public safety. Uh, public safety, you know, is a pretty big deal. It benefits everybody and it's probably the biggest benefit we realize uh, from our government. And I'd like to speak a little bit about public safety and try to tie in agriculture to it. So uh, first I'd like to talk about road usage and traffic, a uh, big issue in South County. Uh, folks that live in South County for any amount of time have seen um, the growth in South County and know uh, the, uh, that the, the volume of traffic has in, increased uh, exponentially. Um, of course, everybody enjoys the views of the cornfields and the pastures and the, uh, the horse farms and uh, the pumpkin patches, but that does come at, a, come at a cost and we must support our farmers. Uh, two ways I like to talk about that we can do that. Um, is just to simply share the road with the farmers. Um, we are, are in an agriculture community. Uh, the farmers need to get their equipment up and down the road, and it's just so important to give them the right of way. Uh, take your time, don't get impatient, and just let the farmers do, 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 do what they need to do to get up and down the roads. Uh, another issue I'd like to talk about is deer, the deer population. Uh, we've talked about this many, many times. Um, everybody loves to see the uh, uh, the, um, the yearlings frolicking on the side of the road and in the, in the fields during the spring. Um, but when you're, you or your pet uh, contract uh, Lyme's disease uh, or some other de dearborn disease or the, a deer ends up in the grill of your car um, or uh, it's the farmers that uh, lose a large percentage of their crop to the deer, uh, you know, they're not, so, uh, they're not so nice to have around anymore. And nobody would advocate uh, getting rid of the deer population. We just need to work on right-sizing it. And, um, and in this county, well, in the state, there's about 31,000 uh, deer accidents per year, deer car collisions per year. Um, and it, State Farm said each, each accident costs about $4,200. So if you uh, multiply that out, it's $132 million in deer car damage in the state. Uh, I looked at uh, DNR's, um, some of the DNR statistics and, uh, and, and what percentage of deer are harvested in Maryland. So if you extrapolate that out, there's about four to five million dollars worth of deer car damage in Anne Arundel County every year. So it is important to keep that deer population in check. That's probably, you know, and here in, in, in South County, uh, you know, we, we all know somebody that's hit a deer um, it, it's, it's, you just have to be careful, um, but we do need to de keep that deer population in check. Um, I know we have worked with some programs with the county executive office and the county executive, uh, great programs, uh, and it, it, it has helped. I think it has helped. Um, and not only does it, does it, has it reduced or hopefully reduced the deer population somewhat, but that venison has been able to be utilized for those that are in need and less fortunate than you and I. So it's a, it's, it's a win-win situation um, to, to get that venison in the hands of, the, of those that can really use it. Got a 
Most Pop Place. Okay, I also wanted to speak about, um, you know, we speak about uh, public safety. Uh, we need to speak about law enforcement also because uh, without them, um, you know, it would be a, the, the roads would be in much worse condition. So uh, uh, I have noticed over the last, uh, uh, probably the last half year, year, uh, an increase in, 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 in county police out on the roads. I don't know if everybody else has, um, but it definitely has been noticeable. Uh, I do kind of travel at odd hours, you know, late in the evening after meetings. And, and I see them and I see that they're out there, you know, they're out there have folks pulled over and, and, and hopefully issuing citations for folks that are, they're not probably doing the right thing. So, uh, you know, that's, that, that's a great benefit um, um, to, to have this increased uh, enforcement out there. And it'll definitely, uh, definitely help with uh, a lot of the public safety on the road raise. And with that, I, I did. I did just find out today that uh, that um, sworn officers in the county have increased from 700 to 800, and I thought that was fantastic. So that kind of confirms what I've been seeing out there on the road. Uh, firefighter numbers are up. Um, increased pay is up uh, for many of our first responders, and and that's what needs to, ha to happen to keep those folks in the county and keep them employed and keep the uh, the county safe. And in closing, I'd also like to mention the Galesville Firehouse. Uh, I don't know how many of you travel up and down Muddy Creek Road, but we have a new firehouse um, right on Muddy Creek Road. Uh, it, uh, it, it's glad to see it, it's completed. It was much needed. Um, I'm, probably, I'm sure there's other firehouses in the county that need uh, the same type of uh, overhaul, um, but that's a, that's a great benefit to us, us, us folks that are in South County. And I'm really, uh, really pleased that that's been, uh, that's been completed and it's, and it's in use. And uh, that's really all I have. I just uh, uh, d did want to uh, ask the county executive if, if he had any other uh, input on these topics or if he'd like to expand on them. And, um, you know, I look forward to, uh, to work with everybody in the future. Thanks. Yeah, John has been uh, stepped up every time he's asked. Farm Bureau, the fair, and uh, kind of kind of resident we need more of. Um, so thank you, John. Um, yeah, I mean, I always uh, say that probably government was in invented to protect its people uh, from whatever the dangers are. And so um, as a county executive, one of the things that I've um, learned is that Everybody in the police department, everybody in the fire department, detention, all of them, they're part of county government. And in fact, the police department is, is closest to the community, probably more than any. They're in the neighborhoods, sometimes walking the street, driving the street, talking to people. And, um, and so um, fire department and EMT are there too. They're only there when, you're, when there's real trouble. Um, and, and so they really are heroes, and um, um, we have to make those jobs desirable, just like the teaching jobs that I was talking about. Um, so I believe that, that you know, morale is in a pretty good place in our county. One of the things that we've had to do is provide equipment. And so in addition to having enough in the police department, enough officers and enough pay, is have the equipment that you need so that your vehicles, um, we now have, it, just in this budget, we got to the point where every sworn officer, when they get their badge and they go through the training program, they will also get a car and a squad car. Um, the body work cameras are something that just started a couple of years. They've only been on them for about a year, and they're incredibly popular. The officers um, love the fact that there's a video of everything. So a lot of them will tell me they'll watch the videos after an interaction, and they will basically assess themselves and sometimes they'll sit together and they'll talk about how their their performance in a certain situation and and they go through training now at our police academy right here in Davidsonville that is I think the best training anywhere in the state um, it's a great academy and it's got great instructors and when I talk to the young officers that come through the academy um, 
they really are, you know, sort of like starry-eyed young people who want to change the world for the most part. They say they want to serve the community and they want to be the best police officer. And I asked them what that means. And I had one tell me that means that every interaction with a citizen, that they feel like that that, that citizen, it made their day better. I don't think of interactions with the police that way, but that's <laughs> great that they do um, and, and try to make it like that. Um, so, uh, but in South County, Traffic and safety are big, and, and a lot of the work that the police department has done does is you know dealing with speeding and dealing with with drunk driving and and um, we just signed on last week to a thing called Vision Zero that counties are um, if they do it and they implement it then they're eligible for funding that they wouldn't be eligible for otherwise and it's got to do with planning and it's got to do with law enforcement and implementation to reduce the the numbers of traffic fatalities and traffic. Um, injuries on our roads were actually ranked third in fatalities in the state of Maryland of 23 counties. So um, we have we have work to do on that. Um, in the fire department, we um, you know I, you may remember there was a federal grant that was going to allow Anne Arundel County to hire more firefighters, and and we won the grant. But then um, the uh, the administration actually turned sent the money back, and the union was quite upset about it. The firefighters union. Um, so we, um, we have a great new fire chief, we have a great new police chief too, Mal Awad is our police chief, and then Trisha Wolford is our fire chief, and it's interesting, our Office of Emergency Management is also a woman named Preeti Emmerich, and, and um, I feel like uh, um, we have a, a really good threesome of women that are running public safety in this county, and uh, they're highly respected around the state, and the morale in all three of those departments is up, and, and um, I feel more safe uh, as a result of their work. But um, in the fire department, most of their calls, their call volume has increased drastically over the last decade, um, more than our population has increased. And that's why it was so important to get the new firefighters in, which we did, um, and we're continuing to recruit and train in our fire academy, um, but a lot of new equipment. And one of the great things about having a budget surplus and some federal money is you have what we call one-time money that you can't spend on recurring stuff like hiring people and raises, but you can buy equipment. And so we have bought a lot of fire equipment in the last uh, last two years, and, and that's putting us in a better position and catching us up. So that's helping with morale, um, and morale is big. We're also, um, most of our calls are emergency management calls, and so um, we have not had enough paramedics, so we've doubled the pace of, of getting paramedics trained. Um, in, in our fire department so that we have more of those. But COVID was really, really tough on those folks. Um, and, and having to suit up in all, the, all of the, uh, um, the extra gear that they had to to go into a house, not knowing whether they were gonna be exposed, and then waiting outside emergency rooms, an amazing amount of time of our emergency management folks and our ambulances are spent waiting outside emergency rooms because there's no capacity. Um, so that's gotten a little better as COVID has declined. Um, but um, a real challenge for us. So we will continue to do that. One of the things that we've done is in this budget, we've um, finally joined the, <clears throat> I would say, the rest of the civilized world in the state and are combining our 911 call centers, police and fire, and building a new 911 call center for them that will also be our emergency management center. And our emergency management team, we have professionalized. It used to be grant funded only, so you'd have people who worked for a year or two and then the grant would run out and you'd lose them. Um, so we've got a really good team now under pre Emmerich that is doing more than just what we think of as emergency management. They were there for during COVID. Um, they, they have been there for Af Afghan refugees that have nowhere to go. It's an emergency. They're at the airport or at a hotel at the airport and they step, they're the ones who step in. Um, so they've been stepping in, you know, not only for major weather events, but um, any crisis that you can imagine. So um, um, we're lucky we have a great team and we just have to continue providing the resources that they need to serve us. So questions on that. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. So we have a few people that signed up to ask questions on, on public safety. Um, Louis Ford, you want to take this one? Yeah. All right. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, John, it raised on a few things. You know the deer. Everybody's tired of hearing the deer, hearing about the deer. But I'm tired of losing money. I'm a first generation farmer. You know, I don't think my kids are going to take over what I've been working for for 25 years. You know, um, everybody wants to keep South County rural, you like the farmland. If y'all don't do something about these deer, there ain't going to be no farmland. Program 
that you tried to or you did initiate a year or two ago, you know, a lot of us thought was a very good program. Department of Natural Resources didn't think so, you know. Um, but talking to the local farmers in this county, what you need to do, and you have the power to do it, is open Sunday hunting for guns. We already have one or two during a muzzle loader season and a gun season, but you need to open up more. You know, there's not enough hunters, there's too many deer. You know, enough on the deer. Uh, you know, and that can fall under environment, that can fall under health and, and, and you know, public safety, all that. Um, you know, the deer ticks, the Lyme's disease, the horses are getting Lyme's disease, you know that. You're an equine guy. Um, but the thing is, I really want to touch on are the trees along these roads in this county. can't say the right word in public, but uh, they're, they're a catastrophe. You know, there's a lot of us farmers that have equipment that's 12, 14 foot wide, 14 foot high. You know, when I drive and the people that work for me drive equipment up and down the road, I said, anytime you get the chance to get fully off the road, you do so. And there's only a couple spots on Money Creek Road we can do that. Route two from here down to 261 is a joke. I have to ride in the lane. And of course, I got miles of traffic backed up. I don't like doing that. I know people got places to go, you know, work, they want to go home, they're on vacation, whatever. You know, and I don't need to be blocking the roads up. But I am not going to knock the mirror or the windows out of the cab of one of my tractors just because of state highway, and I don't know who's got control of them, whether the county has control of trimming the state roads or what. And, and to touch on Mr. Favor's uh, fire department, Galesville Fire Department, and that fire department's been open for two, three years now. And you know that light doesn't work, that yellow, nice yellow flashing light <laughs> almost got hit by a fire truck. Because in the morning when I go to work, I go to Highs, grab a cup of coffee or something, and the guys and the women are out there washing the fire trucks or checking the lights. I don't pay no attention because the light is flashing yellow. But about two weeks ago, one of them was coming, and he was coming hard, and I was like, oh, shit. And when I stopped, I got out of my truck and asked the guy behind me, I said, was that light flashing yellow or was it flashing red? He said, it's still flashing yellow. It never changed to red. So that's something that the county or state, whoever's got control over that light needs to look at. Um, Mr. I'm going to need you to, to summarize your comment. Uh -huh. I'm going to need you to summarize. <laughs> the deer, you fix the lights. Cut the trees. <laughs> yeah. Um, you heard about the deer, right? You got the senator and hope maybe a future delegate here. The Maryland General Assembly um, um, does, well, they do the deer hunting laws, right? I mean, DNR seems to be in control of all that, though. Whenever DNR goes to the General Assembly and they testify on something having to do with deer, um, it seems like uh, most of the most of the General Assembly goes with what D DNR says. I, but we're going to change that. I, so DNR came after us, and we said, we, "Well, here's the program that we were talking about." Was COVID comes along, and and remember, there was a while where it was really hard to get meat, and uh, there was a shortage, and. Uh, we knew we had too many deer, and uh, so we put together a program through economic development where we not only paid for the cost of processing if you would take that deer carcass to one of our processors that signed up, um, we would pay for the processing, but we would also reimburse that hunter for a little bit of gas, a little bit of time, 50 bucks a deer. Um, and uh, to incentivize killing more doe, because a lot of the hunters go out and they just want to get the buck, right? But we need, we need to get more doe, we need to get more, and the, the bag limits are high enough that we could have a real impact if every, every hunter went to their bag limit. And uh, so we did it, we got away with it that first year, um, but uh, they told us it was a bounty and that was illegal, and our office of law said one thing, they said what we were doing was legal, and the state attorney general's office, well, they didn't have a full opinion on it, but um, they, that, was, that was questionable whether it was legal. So we introduced a bill to make it legal. Even if it's not legal, let's make it legal to do this. And um, 
the, uh, the bill didn't get very far. <laughs> um, so um, the, they, they said that somehow there would be no more, no more deer. The bottom line is that DNR, I know there's some Bambi lovers here. Stop glaring at me like that, but <laughs> Matt. Um, DNR, DNR does not want the population to, re, to go down very far, and the farmers are losing money, losing money, losing money, want the population down further. So we have this problem that so at the end of the day, somebody's going to have to tell DNR, we need to reduce this herd because of, because of the impact. And, and whether it's done by Sunday hunting or Saturday hunting or Tuesday hunting or more hunting or, or market hunting where you can actually sell the venison, we've got to kill more deer. Um, the, um, um, I mean, I hear what you're saying on Sunday hunting, but I've also seen the numbers that show that when you do that, then there's less Saturday hunting. And it is more convenient to have the full weekend, and I, I hear you, but um, um, that can be done by the General Assembly. So, uh, but I don't think it's going to make much impact at myself. I think we gotta, we've got to have an incentive for people to, do, to kill the damn deer. Sorry I said it like that. But, um, and as far as the trees, um, yeah, it's on the state roads, it is the state, they, they do the trimming. We have county roads too, and we have the same problem. And, and I know you get calls from farmers, and I know you send your road crews out, um, and you, you, you try to trim them back. So at least if it's a county road, make sure you call and, and you know, you can take a picture too. You can take a picture from the con combine and <laughs> send it in. I, I get a ticket for that. <laughs> Um, but I think they're pretty good about it. I mean, I know Chris understands the problem. It, the, these roads, our county roads and our state roads, need, you need to be able to get a combine through. Um, so um, those things are expensive, it's expensive to repair. And what was the other? Oh, the flashing light. I don't know. I'll ask about it. I, um, I've heard people complain about that light because it makes them focus on that and not the other thing because it's so close to the, to the red light. But at least we have a fire station. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's already texted. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Ne next up, um, Ed Woods. Middle oh, walk. Good. You're going to get together. <laughs> I, uh, for the record, I'm Ed Woods, Vice President of Davidson Health Civic Association. I had a couple of remarks on public safety. After listening to the opening remarks on education by Ms. Brown, um, I ditched that. I have something different to say. Um, she brought, it's like a, a slap upside the head, actually, when she mentioned a child that was afraid to go to school. No child should ever be afraid to go to school. No parent should ever be afraid to send a child to school. And no employee should ever be afraid to go to work at school. If Anne Arundel County doesn't have, and I honestly don't know if you do or not, something called school resource officers in the police department, you need to get on it now. The way things are going in this world, we all read the same papers, we all know what's going on out there. If we're going to protect our children, I have a great granddaughter who is a student in this very school that we're meeting in right now. If we can't protect our children, who can? Nobody's, nobody's going to show up and create a miracle and do it for us. I would strongly urge the entire administration. The incoming administration, whether you come back, whether, you know, whatever happens in elections, that's, that's life. But no matter what happens, this is something we need, in my opinion, we need to pursue. School resource officers, to the best of my knowledge from counties that have them, work pretty hard all day in the school. Children learn why what a police officer is, why they're there, what they do. Most importantly, they learn to trust them. They learn to work with them. So that's, that's one thing. Another thing that can be done strictly by a stroke of a pen, possibly, I don't know. But 
I'm reading too much about incidents that happened where people were aware that someone was not in good shape mentally, and they ignored it. Nobody told them about the other thing. It's one thing we know in the fire department. I'm retired after a career in the fire department. I still volunteer after 64 years. The one thing we know, if you see something, say something. We need to emphasize when somebody sees something, they need to say something. When they say something, the people who are saying it too need to take it seriously. I learned one thing not too long ago. There was an incident Mr. Woods, I'm, shooting. I'm going to need you to summarize your, your comment yeah. for yeah. There was a, uh, a shooting, and someone said that they thought there was a problem. They they'd heard some comments, but they were afraid to say something because they didn't want to offend anybody. I'd much rather be offended and alive than dead and unoffended. Uh, we need to change the direction we're going in in a number of things. This is one of them. It's something that is entirely within the purview of the administration, whoever the administration may be, to do this. And we need to get moving on it. That was a, um, I had other remarks about the fire department. I'm dropping that. I won't take up any more time. Right, thank you. Thank you. So we do have a, a very good school resource officer program in the county, and and um, the training that those officers go through in Anne Arundel County is, is a model that other, other counties are doing. So we're sending people out to train in how to do the SRO program. And um, and I hear a lot of positive, positive comments from students, teachers, parents. Um, so that's not changing. And, and tips can be given anonymously. All right. So we're going to move into and just take a, a handful of, of comments slash questions from people on topics outside of these three issue areas. Um, Thomas Ellis, are you still wanting to make a comment? No, I'm fine. We've already covered two of the things. All right. Um, Charles or Sue Taylor? This is kind of off the subject of everything that you've been talking about, but it does regard, regard the county funds for the police, the teachers, and everything else, and for our parks. One of the things is that I think is a total embarrassment in our county is our roads. If you drive tonight on Route 2, after you go past the Kmart Shopping Center, going into up near Glory Days into Tagorol. Those roads are horrible, horrible. And it's not just that, that's just an example. Um, I travel Sands Road at times. Those dump trucks are destroying that road. I've called transportation in prior years. Yeah, they finally come out and fix a couple potholes, but guess what? Everything they put in that pothole is now out of it. And it's, it's just ridiculous that more funding can't be applied to our roads in the county. That's all. Thank you. Now Chris Phipps has two people he's going to bring with him to the budget, to the budget meetings. <laughs> Chris Phipps does public works. It's also roads. They seem to, to do everything, keep the county running. Um, and and um, I mean, I, I have to say that while I agree with you that there are, there are problems where the road, places where the roads are a problem, and sometimes it's a county road, sometimes it's a state road, that um, when I came in and I got the presentation from Public Works about, about um, the percent, the condition of the roads, they, they rank them, and, and then they have a, a system where they go through and they, get, they, they try to, get, to keep them from getting really bad, um, comparing our county to other counties. The data looks good. Um, but it's a constant struggle, and and uh, yeah, more money means we could get more done, right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to be paving Sands Road in the FY23. Sands Road is in the FY23 budget, so we have funding for a 
upcoming fiscal year is going to be nine miles of basically the whole stretch okay. down to Southern Maryland Boulevard. The sand, the uh, gravel pits, the owners of those gravel pits, because those dump trucks are tearing the vegetable growth up. And, well, and that's something I know that our land use officer is very much in tune with, working with those uh, businesses to make sure that they're complying with any zoning conditions they have time and everything else but as far as the road itself we will be paving it this coming year into next year it could be probably be spring of that of fiscal year going oh, nine, into, nine, nine, all the way down to southern maryland boulevard even across 408 so that section as well and then J justin wells is We'll let you come up to Kayla and we'll and have another turn after after we get through everybody. Hi, um, we have a particular problem on my block, but I'll try to make my question very generic. That's my plan too. And that is uh, it's about zoning and residential property values. Um, we live in like two acre lots. We have no homeowners association because this is not part of the, who we are now. Lucky for you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. But uh, we have, uh, in, a, in our particular case, again, this we speak in generic way, of a person who is having his business there, and we're not talking about parking his work truck there in the evening or anything like that. We're talking about bringing in heavy equipment and stuff like that, or his landscaping business and stuff like that. Is the county zoning area, I guess, what is the plan for protecting residential property you know, values. Because, I mean, personally, I would like to see this guy get rich. I have nothing against him or anything like that. But I'm not on the back of my property values. So I know it's not a real attractive thing to get uh, have to deal with opposing county residents and stuff like that. But again, generically, is the county zoning uh, priority I, I can I can I can see Steve Kai Ziegler wants to say something. Go ahead, and and yeah, um, go ahead, and then I'll add to whatever. So let's uh, let's talk after this meeting. Um, but yes, absolutely, we do. We have a, a zoning enforcement section. Um, most of our enforcement is based on the vast majority is based on complaints. The exact situation you're talking about is one we deal with dozens of times a day. So. Uh, we take it seriously. There's a major effort uh, in any planning and zoning department in the county, in the country, where we want to protect private property rights. And the example you just shared is one we need to investigate. But like you say, sometimes it is complaint driven. And, and um, sometimes it hurts my soul to see, <laughs> you know, somebody who's, who's not inside the law they, somebody files the complaint, it puts them out of business, it destroys their livelihood. It's tough, it's tough, but the laws are the laws. So don't, don't turn them in unless you want them to really, you know, enforce the law, because they will. Well, it can, it can be anonymous, many of ours are. You're gonna share some information for me and we're gonna go look at it. Kayla, maybe. <laughs> I'm ready. I'll leave the government. All right. So um, at the intersection of Sands Road and 408, I've seen too many accidents, and I'm going to be honest with you. I tell you, if it's my family, it's going to be World War III at that end. Um, leading out of the Dollar General and Tracker Supply parking lot, I've tried to contact the Dollar General. They give no, and there's no line. 
So when you're exiting or entering, people don't realize that it's two separate lanes. They're all just coming head on to one another. It's happened way too many times to me. Um, I was told that it was a private road, so there's nothing the county or state can do about it, but I'm encouraging somebody to contact Dollar General. Um, there's a light pole down on 408 when you come off of the exit for Route 4 when you're coming off to go towards Wason's Corner on your right hand side. There's a light down. Um, it's been down for a few weeks. Um, Sandra, going on to, so if you're on 408. Did you write that one down? Can you, can you talk to State Highways? Are you going to talk? Who's going to? Yeah. Okay, because when she goes this, this fast, I just want to make sure it's somebody. Sorry, I'm trying to be quick. Tell me to minimize it. <laughs> um, if you're coming down, You have two sand roads. You have one on the right and one on the left. The one on the left, there is no exit. I don't think people realize that. There's no way out. Um, their back road, I don't even know what that road is called. I call it the service road. Yeah. Um, on the service road, you can't see coming out. So the county or state has put a, um, yeah, some kind of cement barrier there. People go around it, and I almost got, could have died coming through there. And I followed someone to the post office, I did, and I let them know my thoughts. But I'm just saying that it's not safe. I recommend a camera there because at that point, what else can you do? You know, you already got the cement barrier there, but people don't care. All the signs are there, they don't care. That thing's been there, it's been no exit for at least 10 years before I can even drive and it's people still coming out of there. So I just recommend those things being touch base, especially the intersection, because it's really, really dangerous. Um, and then in regards to Paven Sands Road. Did you, I, I, I do need you to summarize. I see I know it's coming. it's coming. In regards to the Sands Road, there's no point in spending taxpayer dollars paving that road if them dump trucks are still going to come 300 trucks a day. It don't make no sense. So no point in spending the money paving it if it's going to get damaged again within three weeks. All right. Oh, let me tell you, my family, I said you, we followed him. My mom followed him all the way down up a mark. But you know what they're doing instead? They're acquiring property to make up for it. Thank you. I was actually encouraged by a couple things, so thank you. I know that um, the plan 2040 was really looking at trying to smartly grow the county. And I say grow with quotation marks around it because we are in the rural part of the county and I think it's extremely important to keep South County rural. We need to have that base of the economy down here to keep um, agriculture going down here so that we can keep the rural nature and character. Um, so I appreciate the fact that uh, the Plan 2040 is looking more at infill and redevelopment. I think those are two very important things when you're talking about growth. Um, I also wanted to very much echo the comments about the roadways and the trees along the roadways. And I know that you, know, you all can be responsible for the county roads, not necessarily the state roads, I understand that, but uh, Billy was correct. Route 2 is just, it is catastrophic. And if you are driving big farm equipment down the road, it's literally scary. So perhaps um, there could be a conversation. I know that a lot of state road issues were brought up tonight. It sounds like it's a good idea to maybe have a conversation with uh, your counterparts at State Highway. I know that State Highway has contracts with tree trimming companies and so forth um, in each of the counties. So uh, maybe it's needling somebody on those uh, tree trimming contracts at the state level, um, just saying that a lot of the citizens in this county have been talking about that. Um, and I also am encouraged about um, land preservation is very important for a number of reasons, um, but I do think um, I was encouraged by your comment about being able to keep these lands that are in preservation viable and profitable. You can't just put it in preservation, lock it up, and put a bow around it, and that be it. Uh, the economy these days is changing extremely rapidly. We need to be able to uh, adjust to that. Um, and I know, again, a lot of the preservation issues aren't necessarily county per se. If you're in a state easement, we would need to have those discussions with those state agencies and so forth. But starting to have those discussions uh, and making it known that um, you know, commercial isn't necessarily always a bad word, and we have to be able to adapt 
um, on our preserved aglands. So thank you. Commercial on farms, you mean? Is that yeah? Right. I mean, and farming is a commercial preserved, venture. Yeah. Yeah, particularly yeah. on preserved farms because a yeah. lot of and I know the county's been trying to do a lot. Um, you know, the ag commission a couple of years ago came up with legislation to try to recognize a lot of those issues, but a lot of it is notwithstanding the easement, this, that, and the other. So it's the easement that uh, needs to be taken into consideration too. And we can have those discussions with the county at the state level. I wonder who we'll be talking to. <laughs> if anybody doesn't know, Emily Wilson does the, the, the open space programs for the state. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for thank you. Probably not not many people have done more to preserve open space in the state of Maryland than Emily Wilson. So thank you for your service. Uh, we, we've got time for one more question and then closing remarks and yeah. Wrap it up. I'm Julia House, but I'm going to take off my chamber attire at the moment and put on my parent and resident. Um, uh, title. Uh, Anne Arundel County Public Schools is funded 52% by our county budget, um, or 52% of our county budget is, is funding Anne Arundel County Public Schools, and we have a major issue coming up with the change in start times this year. Um, our former county uh, superintendent had told us before he left that it was not coming together as planned. The transportation, all of the bus Companies are telling us it's not coming together as planned. Anne County Police Department is telling us it's not coming together as planned. We're short um, bus drivers, we're short crossing guards. HR Department is telling us that we're short teachers, we're short, short substitutes, we're short all of those um, assistant program and assistant um, employees that we need in order to implement this kind of plan. And our child care is telling us that we don't have enough to be able to let these children who are in elementary schools come home by themselves. I know it's not the, the burden of an older child to be able to provide that daycare or that child care for that younger child, um, but our facilities can't withhold it either. So I really urge you to take a step and to work with the new superintendent on delaying this until the county can get some of that infrastructure into place because that's really where it's going to end up and it's going to look it's going to look bad um, and it, I don't want it to happen the week before school starts because it's going to really implement some major issues businesses are working with parents right now to try and adjust those schedules but they're doing it hesitantly because we're hoping that it'll fall through and that people will, will give us another year to, to figure out some of these issues so thank you yeah thanks for bringing <clears throat> Thanks for bringing that up, because um, I agree wholeheartedly that um, they should delay this um, for this coming year. Uh, I sat down with um, the superintendent and with the leadership of the board, I think three board members, just a couple weeks ago, and I brought with me um, um, the, the police department and Rec and Parks. And they both articulated very clearly why it was that um, the change in times and the compression of the hours because of the change in times um, was going to mean they would need more crossing guards at a time when they're already down crossing guards because of the labor shortage. Um, and for rec and parks, what it would mean for the child care centers that are at schools, um, that it would mean um, that their shortage of child care workers would be um, made, more, made worse. And then I've been meeting with bus driving companies and many times since this all started where we had to step in and provide some of our federal money to, to do a hiring and retention bonus so that we get more drivers in. And they're saying that because the drivers can't do as many routes, it means more drivers will be needed. And, and so um, we've strongly encouraged them to postpone it for a year and uh, it hasn't happened. So I think it probably won't happen, but we will continue to push and anybody else who wants to push is welcome to. It's a board of education decision. Um, they will say that we can't turn back now because we've already set up the, the planning for it. Um, but I have been told by um, Dr. Arlotto and others that yes, they can. They have the old system in place. It just means that the work that they've done to implement the new system won't take effect until the following year. So it's not wasted work. 
Um, so that's where we stand, and I think it will be a difficult start to the school year. I think people will feel it the most visibly with the school buses, because when they don't pick up the kids, it's a disaster, and that's what we saw, that's what we've seen so far. It's happening all over the country, um, but um, it's, um, you know, we are hustling um, in all those agencies to recruit. You'll see all kinds of recruitment efforts going on. Um, you'll see me stepping in, trying to get publicity for the recruitment efforts. But um, they're telling us that they will not be able to, um, to hire enough child care workers, crossing guards, or bus drivers. Um, and, and it won't solve the problem to delay the start time, but uh, the start time makes it worse. That's a happy note to end on, isn't it? <laughs> Anybody got anything? Uh, yeah. <laughs> John Church. Good evening. Let me take advantage of this opportunity to introduce myself. I'm the uh, chairman of the Veterans Affairs Commission in this county, and so in that capacity, I support uh, Mr. Pippen and his uh, administration. I'm here uh, to learn, and I'm taking advantage to introduce myself. If there are veterans in the audience who would like to talk to me about their concerns, please do. Um, I'll wait afterwards and hope to talk to you. Let me underscore one program that Mr. Pittman initiated last May, which is the uh, Veterans Service Telephone Number. Uh, it's easier to say it's the hotline, but it's close to that. So copy down 410-222-3500. Uh, That's a number that uh, is used by veterans, and people at the receiving end know there's a veteran calling, okay? And in November last year, in conjunction with Veterans Day, uh, Mr. Pittman contracted with a business that uh, specializes in serving veterans and taking care of, um, I'm going to say, more complicated issues that the county does not normally get into, uh, dealing with claims of various kinds. So <clears throat> the program and the services are available. Unfortunately, they're not always well known, um, but I would like to reach out. And we have a couple of spaces, vacancies coming up in the commission. I'm looking for people who might live in this area who might be interested. Um, let me know, okay? I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. So I wanna thank Colonel Church for his service, not only to the country, but also to the Anne Arundel County Veterans Affairs Commission. Um, revitalized that commission and it is vibrant. Anybody who's in office knows and has met with them. Um, and the, the um, the work that we've done together has been primarily focused on, on for, from the county level, how our agencies can make sure that they provide um, assistance to veterans um, and connect them to assistance that already exists. That's why we created the hotline, the number, and also our training, a liaison for every public facing agency of county government, a veterans liaison, so that they will know how to, how to do exactly that. Um, lots more work to do though, so um, please join the commission if you, if you can. So we, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, I do want to say, going back to Ms. House comment, that we, we are recruiting. That there is a child care job fair by the Anne Arundel County Reps and Parks. It, it is on Saturday, July 16th from 10.30 to 12.30 p.m. at the Michael Bush Library in, in Annapolis. Um, but, but help push that out. Like every department that, that touches part of that school start times um, labor shortage is, is heavily recruiting now, holding job fairs. Get the word out. We're, we're looking to hire people. Um, so. Again, that's, that's Saturday, July 16th from 10.30 to 12.30 at the Annapolis Library. Um, kind of Executive, do you have any closing remarks you want to give before we end? I would also say that bus drivers are going to be getting five bucks more an hour than they were getting at the beginning of last year with the retention bonus we created. And then the school board came in with a budget request to increase half of that. And we're going to do another bonus to get them through. And, and they will continue to get five bucks more. Still not as much as driving for Amazon, but it's a whole lot, um, it's, a, it's a better public service. <laughs> Uh, so no, I will just uh, close by saying thank you for coming, and um, um, you have you have probably my number, James' number, Vincent's number. Um, the community engagement and constituent services team is really fantastic. They are committed to not only dealing with individual constituent constituent plate complaints or issues, but also working with community-based groups, some of whom are here, um, to help you build capacity and, and really have a voice in how government works. Um, so, thank you for coming. Thank you.